Hello and welcome to Weapons and Warfare for Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. Just ahead on this episode, we get permission to board a craft from a Michigan boat maker that could make a world of difference for special operations units. Plus, the makers behind our Weapon of the Week say it's the next evolution in drones and tilt rotor aircraft. Turns out, when you don't need to account for humans, the craft can be rather remarkable. And in our comms check, we've got dueling mantas competing for open water missions. But first, some headlines you may have missed. With all that's happening in Gaza and Ukraine, news that the U.S. military is pulling out of Niger may have flown under your radar. But it's a development few, if any, in American leadership are happy about. This is the latest domino to fall after a military coup in the West African nation in 2023. So, after spending more than a decade and a billion dollars investing in a counterterrorism mission, plans are underway to withdraw more than 1,000 U.S. service members. Clearly, when it comes to uh, Western Africa and the Sahel, um, we are going to continue to monitor for potential threats throughout that region in order to protect U.S. personnel assets in our interests. Uh, to include the welfare of our partners, uh, and we're going to continue to work with countries throughout the region uh, when it comes to addressing uh, terrorism threats throughout the region. If you're wondering why this is an issue, Niger is surrounded by several countries whose militias have ties to Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Beyond that, it appears the country of 26 million people is turning to Russia and Iran for security services and deals on their uranium reserves. German automotive and arms maker Rhein Metall is set to open an ammunition plant in Lithuania. That's after their director of strategic program organization signed the deal in Vilnius in mid-April. It's a move those involved hope will boost security in the Baltic region. Lithuania, like Ukraine, broke away from the USSR in 1991. And there's more fallout from the Army's decision to cancel its plans for the Future Attack Reconnaissance Aircraft, or FARA program. That helicopter was going to replace the nearly 60-year-old Bell OH-58 Kiowa, but in February, the Army, citing the changing nature of its mission, pulled the plug. And now 400 employees, many of them at the Sikorsky plant in Stratford, Connecticut, will be laid off. While speaking about the decision to cancel the program, the Army's Chief of Staff, General Randy George, said, We are learning from the battlefield, especially Ukraine, that aerial reconnaissance has fundamentally changed. Sensors and weapons mounted on a variety of unmanned systems and in space are more ubiquitous, further reaching, and more inexpensive than ever before. The Army also plans to end production on the UH-60V Black Hawk in fiscal year 2025 due to significant cost growth. This year's Sea Airspace 2024 Exposition put on by the Navy League served a lot of purposes. It was a chance for America's maritime leadership to talk about where their respective branches are and where they're headed. It was also an opportunity for all kinds of companies to build relationships with potential government buyers. One such company that caught our eye was Ghostworks Marine. The boat maker, based in Holland, Michigan, is bringing their extensive history in high-performance yacht racing to the military space. And they think their latest products, the GT-34 Powercat and its slightly smaller sibling, the GT-24, could be big players for America's special forces. On the outside, the GT-34 looks like a very modern center console boat, but it's what's underneath that takes this vessel to the next level. Both our M-Hall line and our GT line look to um, capture bow wake energy as opposed to fight it, right? So when our boats push through the water, we actually push the water up and back and it spins in the tunnels underneath, right? So it creates hydrodynamic lift across the entire hull form and we lift out of the water and, and, and go for a run. So we're not fighting the water, uh, we're, we're using it to actually lift us up. 
uh, which drastically reduces drag, which gives us much higher speeds. It's called the M hull, and Ghostworks says increased speed and fuel efficiency are where the benefits of the design begin. The real payoff is in the ride. So now that we're out on the water at cruising speed at about 35 knots, one of the things you really notice about this Ghostworks boat is just how smooth of a ride it really is. By making a smooth ride, any platform or sensor that's mounted on top of the boat is gonna perform better. It's also gonna lower the wear and tear on the operators themselves. Ghostworks Director of Operations, Patrick Coughlin, says the whole design reduces the wave slap impact on operators by as much as 60%. What we've seen is when we talk to operators and small boat guys especially, is they're hurt. They're, their lower backs are, are, are damaged, their knees are hurt, their ankles are tired. If you go out on a two, three hour patrol or insertion, then you're expected to do your mission. Then you gotta do another two, three hours home on something that's effectively a, a workout in itself. Um, they're just exhausted. Of course, the only way to know how smooth that ride really is, is to take one. So that's what we did. On a beautiful spring day, we headed out to the Potomac with the Ghostworks crew aboard the GT34 Powercat. Through its unique application of racing tech, Ghostworks says it can meet immediate military needs. Why did it take so long to combine all of these many factors to make one boat that has it all and that's so efficient? I think people are resistant to change, and there's stuff that's tried and true, and you really know how it works, and this is developmental. So it takes a certain person or a certain application where they're like, we we want to go that way, we want to see. Yeah. You know, because there's some, some inherent learning curves that you're going to have to assume. Another selling point for Ghostworks, customization. You could build whatever type of cabin you need on it. We can carry lots of weight and payloads. Um, but you're going to have the exact same ride principles and the exact same control capabilities and the smooth ride that you know, you're experiencing out on the water today, you're going to have regardless of how you want to config the top. Something else that really helps set Ghostworks apart, time. According to the company, most builds only take six to nine months to complete. Lastly, a quick thank you to Sidney Cleaver for getting us on the GT34 and to Todd Meyer, the captain and man responsible for getting us up and down the Potomac safely. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. If there is a common thread in the way future conflicts will be contested, it's the word unmanned. Whether it's autonomous or remotely piloted, the technology is developing rapidly enough these vehicles are already being factored into battle plans. While our entry for Weapon of the Week this week isn't part of those plans just yet, it soon could be. This is the Bell V247 Vigilant, and I'm really excited to tell you all about it. If it looks slightly familiar, there's a reason for that. It's the unmanned version of the Bell V280 Valor, the long-range assault and utility tilt rotor aircraft chosen by the Army to replace the long-serving Sikorsky UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter. Rob Freeland, the Director of Government Relations with Bell, says right now the Vigilant is a concept project, but it has big ambitions. The Vigilant is a, is a, a tilt rotor that's designed from the ground up to take all the human stuff out to give you as much range as you can out of a system. You know, folks always want to carry more stuff. They always want to go have an effect on the enemy. What really helps is when you can launch from unknown areas, you know, mobile areas, but then affect a large part of the battle space from that unknown spot. That keeps the enemy thinking. Those enemies might have a lot to think about. A built-in feature of the Vigilant is versatility. The folks at Bell see the project being able to fill several missions. 
If you design something that has a lot of vertical lift capability and you can fold it up and stuff it into the hangar on a destroyer, um, you don't have to remote pilot it. It's rules-based autonomous and you can pull that, that girl out, spin her up and get out to many hundreds of miles and hang out for a long period of time. You can do anything. Included in anything is gathering intel with surveillance and reconnaissance tools, precision strikes, aerial escorts, as well as delivering supplies and equipment to troops on the ground, just to name a few. So what about those specs? Bell says the 247 can hit a top speed of 300 plus knots per hour and has a long range cruising speed of 240 plus knots per hour. With a ceiling of 25,000 feet, the Vigilant can also carry an internal load of 2,000 pounds or a sling load of 9,000 pounds. The next step for Bell, finding the right partners for the project. The Navy is very interested in something that can take off vertically from a destroyer and get out to really long ranges that are relevant to them in their warfight. Uh, the Marine Corps is really interested in using this and once you get the, the basic aircraft in place, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with it. You can even do logistics work with it. So the idea is a multi-mission aircraft, and uh, we've come a long way in that, in that design. One final thought, a big thank you to Bell's Director of Global Public Affairs, Jeremy Martin and Rob Freeland for their invite to tour Bell's Advanced Vertical Lift Center. It was a visit we won't forget anytime soon. Time now for our comms check segment, and this week we have an update on a former weapon of the week. Kind of. So back in February, we profiled the K4 Manta from Kraken Technology Group. You can see it right there. So imagine our surprise when Northrop Grumman announced they had finished building a full-sized, uncrewed, underwater vehicle prototype. The name of this UUV? You guessed it, the Manta Ray. This Manta was built through Grumman's partnership with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA. While the two vary in some notable ways, it seems their objectives are fairly similar. They're both targeting long-range and payload-capable undersea missions without the need for a human on board running the platform. As for the differences, the K-4 uses foil technology to cruise at the water surface, minimizing drag while Northrop Grumman's version looks more like its namesake and operates like it as well, gliding through the water rather than on top of it. Started in 2020, the Manta Ray recently received the go-ahead for Phase 2 testing. That means Northrop Grumman will work on subsystems as well as fabrication and in-water demonstration. As for the K-4, the last public update was that it had successfully taken part in a technical experimentation event with the U.S. Special Operations Command. And that's going to do it for us this week for comms check. But remember, if you have a question or thought that you'd like to share with us, you can just hit us up at weaponsandwarfare at san.com. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, that just about does it for us here at Weapons and Warfare. But before we go, I want to wrap up the show talking a little about the protests we've seen on American college campuses the last few weeks slash months. Now, before I start, I want to say I've covered protests on the ground as part of a field crew, and we made distinctions in our reporting between protesters calling for societal change and agitators out for destruction. So, when it comes to the protesters against Israel, specifically, I'm talking about the people protesting in support of Hamas, a terrorist organization with ties dating back to the Nazis. Now, I say protesters, but I'm not really sure if that's the right word to describe these folks. Agitators may certainly be more precise. In some cases, terrorist sympathizers may be more apt. Now, in the words of Boy Sets Fire, one of my all-time favorite punk rock bands, protest is patriotism. Let me say that again. Protest is patriotism. In the United States, we have a right to peaceably assemble and petition our government for a redress of grievances. 
And when you care enough about your country to take the time to gather somewhere and say, no, we don't like this. We want something better. That's patriotic. But what's happening on the campuses of some of our nation's schools is not patriotic because it isn't even protest. If you want to take a stance against the Israeli government's offensive in Gaza or American aid to the Israeli government, okay, we may not agree, but that is an intellectual viewpoint I can at least understand. But when you have groups of people in America saying they are Hamas, that Intifada should come to the U.S., that is not protest. That is calling for open warfare in the streets against soldiers and civilians alike. It's calling for October 7th style massacres to be carried out here. If you think we have a gun problem in America, God help us if we start to have an intifada problem too. Now, this is historical fact and I encourage you all to look it up if you think I'm wrong. Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, an organization that has direct ties to the Nazis. The Muslim Brotherhood loved Hitler so much, they had portions of Mein Kampf translated into Arabic because killing Jews, gypsies, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community was a unifying cause for these murderous maniacs. So, to the people aligning yourselves with Hamas, while you may think you're standing up to an alleged genocide, what you're really doing is supporting past atrocities and calling for new ones. That isn't progressive. That isn't forward thinking. It's barbarism. And I hope those supporting it feel the shame of their actions and change their ways very soon, while also understanding the consequences of their actions. And that is going to put an end to the action here this week on Weapons and Warfare. Sure do hope you learned something. As always, if you want to share your thoughts with us or an opinion, please feel free to do so by emailing weaponsandwarfare at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson for Straight Arrow News, signing off.